Hello and welcome to the National Security Conversation. There is a new revolution in military affairs that is underway today, which many analysts believe would complicate strategic stability as we know it today. So what are these new technologies and who has these technologies? How well is China faring in the field of hypersonic missiles, quantum computing and artificial intelligence? And what implications do these have, especially China's capabilities? for India's national security. To discuss this and more, I have with me in the studio, Professor Vipin Narang. Vipin is an associate professor at the uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, associate professor of political science. Uh, his book, Nuclear Strategy in the Modern Era, was published by the Princeton University Press in 2014. Uh, Vipin's work has also been published in some of the leading international journals, such as International Security, Journal of Conflict Resolution, the Washington Quarterly and the International Organization. Welcome to the National Security Conversation. Thanks, Happy. It's great to be here. Thank you. We've been um, in October 2018. Uh, you tweeted about the arrival of the third nuclear age. Uh, I'm still grappling with the second nuclear yeah, age. Right. Uh, in fact, several others have also made this argument, but um, you have specifically um, uh, not only tweeted it, but also uh, defended it uh, on Twitter. So what is this new, uh, the third nuclear age? Yeah, so I think we're entering, I think 2017 and 2018, when we look back, will mark a real discontinuity uh, in the nuclear era. The first nuclear age was really the Cold War dynamic between the U.S. and the Soviet Union. I mean, it was really marked by a huge superpower competition uh, where both sides developed tens of thousands of nuclear weapons uh, across a whole spectrum of low-yield, battlefield, strategic, submarine-based. Uh, and that ended with the end of the Cold War. The second nuclear age, at least in my reading, was in the post-Cold War era where the United States in particular was really focused on non-proliferation. And you can look at the arc of the first Gulf War, 1990, 1991, mm -hmm. the second Gulf War in 2003, Syria, uh, Libya, and then North Korea as the efforts to stop states in the post-Cold War era from getting nuclear weapons. And I think we had about 30 years where we're really focused on counter-proliferation and non-proliferation to so-called rogue regimes. Yeah, yeah. 2017 will mark, I think, the discontinuity in that phase because North Korea is the first adversary of the United States and the West to acquire nuclear weapons since China in 1964. At the same time, we now have a renewed arms race between the U.S. and Russia. China is modernizing its program. And I think for the first time in about 30 years, we are reaching an inflection point in the direction of our nuclear arsenals in the United States and Russia. For 30 years, we basically had reduction, reductions, reductions, and some modernization. But for the most part now, 2017, 2018 was all about building back up. The Russians uh, have, uh, are threatening the uh, INF Treaty, the Intermediate Nuclear Force Treaty. They've been in violation now for several years. But finally, I think the Trump administration, led by John Bolton, has said enough is enough and has threatened to withdraw, which may open up the space for another intermediate nuclear force competition between the U.S. and Russia, which are ground-based systems primarily in Europe, but also has implications for East Asia. Uh, and Russia is trying to build capabilities like hypersonic glide vehicles, uh, a, a larger ICBM that can carry more warheads. A big concern for China and Russia is being able to penetrate and defeat American missile defenses, which don't work today, but they fear will work in the future. And so a lot of effort is being put into, you know, this, the nuclear-powered cruise missile, uh, you know, which was an experiment that the U.S. played around with in the 1960s. But what the Russians were playing around with last year, Putin was very proud of this nuclear-powered cruise missile, which isn't a nuclear-tipped, it is nuclear-tipped, but also has a nuclear reactor to power it so it can go long distances. Cruise missiles now can really only go about, you know, 1,000 kilometers or so. But a cruise missile that could have intercontinental ranges yep. and hugs the terrain can defeat mid-course missile defense. So in, so in some ways, then you are making the argument that we are moving away from the mad induced strategic stability, the mutually assured destruction sort of uh, um, 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 induced stability. Is that, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Mutually assured destruction is a condition. Uh, many theorists like Robert Jervis and uh, Bernard Brody described MAD as a fact, not a policy. But it was undergirded by a very technological condition. 
both sides had to accept vulnerability to each other's secure second strike. Absolutely. And once, you know, the Soviet Union and the U.S. went to submarine-based forces that were very difficult to track, but not impossible, uh, and the size of the Soviet and American forces were so big that they could not be disarmed, the notion of mutually assured destruction, that neither side could fully disarm the other side, became, according to Bob Jervis, a fact, not a policy. And in that condition, strategic nuclear use was suicidal. But now, as you noted, a whole host of technologies are emerging where the fundamental assumption of MAD was that survivability, and this is critical to mutually assured destruction and strategic stability, survivability was cheaper and easier to obtain and to maintain than it was to threaten. And the advent of these technologies that uh, may be cheaper, accuracy is cheaper now, the big piece of uh, mutually assured destruction was that a state could hide forces uh, and move them around. Uh, but we're having a sensory revolution now where, and, a, and an inter, you know, a surveillance revolution with commercial satellite imagery of such high resolution that can give you real-time pictures, video of, you know, how a state deploys and moves its nuclear forces. Add artificial intelligence on top of that, which can sift through these reams and reams of data to really locate and pinpoint you know, not necessarily the Russian force, which is extremely large, but the Chinese force, certainly the North Korean force. If you were India, you could say, I might be able to map the Pakistani strategic nuclear force, which only has several dozen long-range systems. Uh, and it's becoming the, the assumption that survivability is cheaper and easier to obtain and maintain than it is to threaten is no longer assumption I think we can take for granted with the advent of these new, new technologies. And that's one piece of it. So the, the first piece is it's getting easier potentially to find, fix, and destroy adversary strategic nuclear forces. And the other piece of this is missile defenses, which is another you know, technological revolution that the U.S. has been working on at various phases. You have terminal phases, mid-course mid phases, boost phases. Uh, theater missile defense have gotten very good. And uh, technologies that are integrated with uh, you know, platforms such as THAAD, Aegis Ashore, uh, have given the U.S. pretty effective missile defenses in East Asia, potentially in Europe. Uh, and against, you know, the problem is ICBM forces like China and Russia can still defeat American mid-course systems today. But the fear in China and Russia is that they may not be able to. But for regional powers investing in missile defenses, where their adversaries are not in the ICBM range, but in the short and medium range, missile defenses have gotten pretty good, which means you don't have to find and destroy your adversary's entire nuclear force. You can shrink it and you know, leave a residual force where missile defenses may have a sporting chance of being able to pick them up. Well, we haven't talked about cyber yet also, right? Because there's a, there's a concern that you know, uh, advanced cyber uh, surveillance, uh, espionage, and then attacks could render a state's entire nuclear force impotent because it could have, you could attack the command and control networks uh, and have single point failure in a state's nuclear force. If, so if you can disrupt a state's right, command and right, control, right. right, then all of this becomes irrelevant right, because you've right. basically rendered the whole thing impotent. Right. As a military historian, do you foresee um, a, a, a sort of situation of technology, technology maturation and then right. uh, there will be a certain amount of stability or do, you don't foresee that Well, at all? I mean, the, the question is whether, the, I mean, there's the, uh, in, in international relations theories, there's a notion of the offense-defense balance, right? And is it, is it cheaper to maintain survivability through decoys, through uh, camouflage, through deception, than it is you know, to, to keep deploying more and more capabilities or warheads to be able to threaten a state's uh, survivability. Now, I'm of the view that the offense has the advantage here. So if you're, if you're trying to maintain survivability, let's call that the offense. If you're trying to maintain survivability, it is cheaper to do that through decoys and through deception by building more trucks and tells, by building you know, decoy warheads that make it hard for missile defense to discriminate, such that I think survivability will be very, very difficult to threaten persistently, even as these new technologies mature. Uh, and there's also, the, you know, this issue, this is a land-based argument. When you go to sea, the question is whether submarine-based force, India has just run a, a deterrent patrol with the Arihant, uh, ensures survivability. The U.S. got very, very good at tracking and hunting Soviet SSBNs at the end of the Cold War. Uh, and it's not necessarily 
a fact or the case that when you move to sea, you're 100% survivable. But it is very, very difficult, you know, to hunt a submarine in the vast, you know, if you in, in the deterrent patrol boxes uh, that states have available to them. Some people make them. the argument that you can have a bunch of drones equipped with the latest uh, detection technology uh, operating Yeah, as, I mean, sea. I think this balance, it has to, we, we have to see how it's going to go, right? So a lot of the early generation SSBNs that India and China are deploying and, and the Pakistanis with the diesel electrics are noisy. And so they have acoustic signatures that would make them easy to, to track now. But in the future, the, the reason the U.S. is investing in a whole new class of SSBNs, the Columbia class, is because the assumption of you know, uh, indefinite survivability is something that the U.S. Navy is not willing to necessarily accept. And they worry about unattended sensors or uh, UAVs, underwater UAVs, being able to track the SSBN force. And so we have to see how these technologies go. I do think that survivability is under threat, though in a ways that they weren't in the Cold War. And right. this is going to change, I think, the character of this nuclear age. But, but, but the bottom line argument that you're making is that if the survivability, survivability of, the, of the nuclear forces of a country can be assured, then there is no reason to worry. I think that's right. But it, there are two conditions. One, there's a technological or an assessment fact. It, do I have survivable, survivable forces? But you also have to have your adversary not consistently try to threaten that survivability. And mutually assured destruction has a... There's a a footnote, which is you have to accept mutually assured destruction. Yeah, yeah. And the big concern during the Cold War was that the United States never really accepted and never wanted to accept vulnerability to the Soviet strategic nuclear arsenal. Uh, and we invested a lot in... Doesn't the ABM treaty in some ways um, show that there was a certain amount of acceptance of it? Well, a, a limited amount, but you know, if you can counterforce a big portion of the uh, Soviet land base force and take out the SSBNs that are at sea, You've rendered, you've neutralized a big portion of the Soviet strategic nuclear force, mm -hmm. and the violation of the ABM treaty when we pulled out in in the 2000s under uh, George W. Bush, I think, was a recognition of the fact that the U.S. had never really been comfortable with the notion of accepting vulnerability to anybody, uh, even the Soviet Union during the Cold War. There was a brief period during the Kennedy administration when the numbers of the Soviet strategic nuclear force got so big and there were no missile defenses that worked that you couldn't reasonably say, okay, I can, you go to the president and say, you know, President Kennedy, I can get rid of 99% of the Soviet strategic nu nuclear force. At which point the president says, well, that still leaves 300 ICBMs or, you know, long range forces that can hit the US. So that's not a game you necessarily want to play. But if you're talking about a small force, and you go to the president today and say, you know, Mr. President, we can get 80 to 90 percent of the North Korean nuclear force. And you have missile defenses, which don't work today, but, you know, if, if you think you can get uh, a missile defense system that actually works, that can pick up the remaining three or four, then in a crisis at least, you could see, uh, you know, a president, adversaries fear, a president might say, okay, I might take the shot then if, you know, the, if the, uh, residual force is small enough that missile defenses have a sporting chance of being able to pick them up. But I want to be clear that our national missile defenses don't work right now. I mean, under uh, simulated environments, they have an empirical success rate of 57% or so. Uh, and we have to assign four interceptors per incoming target. And we only have 44 interceptors. So 11 incoming targets saturates the four, our, our interceptor force already. And the ground-based interceptors uh, are very expensive. Uh, and so it's very easy, this is why I say I think it's very easy to saturate the system and so the offense tends to have the advantage. But the fear that adversaries have is the U.S. pursuit of these systems uh, alone has to force them to start thinking about development cycles way down the road where they have to invest in hypersonic glide vehicles that are very fast that can beat the you know, missile defense system or cruise missiles where the missile defenses are totally irrelevant. And so a lot of the investments now in China and Russia are driven by the fears of missile defense working rather than anything the U.S. is doing with you know, our ICBM force or the SSBN force uh, or tactical nuclear weapons. So if, if you don't have much trust in the American BMD, Ballistic Missile Defense System, what do you think of the Indian ballistic missile well, defense system? There's a distinction we made between the ICBM range targets and then the medium and short range targets. U.S. missile defenses, and I think the Indian systems, the S-400, the S-400 profile and performance envelope is perfect for India against Chinese targets okay. in Tibet and Pakistani targets. It's a one-size-fits-all air defense and missile defense system uh, with enough batteries. Right now, I think India is supposed to buy four batteries of the S-400. Uh, but 
you know, if you add the layer, the, the layered Ashwin and Perth V air defense system and the S400, these are missile defense systems that can actually have a pretty good success rate against short and medium range targets, which is equivalent to what the U.S. has with THAAD and Aegis Ashore in East Asia uh, and also our missile defenses in Europe. Where the warheads aren't in the exo-atmosphere in outer space for very long uh, or in the endo-atmosphere entirely in the, as in short range systems, missile defenses can have gotten really good. I think we're no longer in the world of the Patriot in the first Gulf War, which didn't intercept any targets. But if you look at the Israeli Arrow system, if you look at the American Patriot system now, Aegis Ashore and Thad, missile defenses have improved a lot, and they're only going to improve as software tracking and AI becomes, and you can start integrating you know, the radar systems uh, so that they get good looks at the incoming targets. I think these kinds of systems are only going to get better. So India, frankly, is in a better position with missile defenses than the U.S that has to do with ICBM range targets. So India is, in, India is investing its resources in the right place. India's investments in accuracy, uh, numbers, MIRVs, and missile defenses might reasonably give Pakistan, not China, I think the Chinese arsenal is so dispersed and would be very difficult to locate, but India has a good look at the Pakistani system uh, and has had a good look at the forces especially the long-range forces, which are the ones you really have to worry about, yeah. right? The tactical nuclear systems don't, can't range Delhi and Bombay. Uh, 60 kilometers. 60 kilometers. I mean, that's not, you know, and they push a lot of fissile material into that. So the strategic nuclear force is at a place where, you know, the U.S. could look at the Pakistani strategic force with, you know, and lick its chops, right? Because if it could find and locate a big bulk, you know, a big portion of it, uh, you know, if it was facing that kind of adversary, it could, it could reasonably say the missile defenses might pick up the rest. I don't think India is at a position where it can actually neutralize the Pakistani strategic nuclear force. But if I were Pakistan, I might worry that investment in all these different pieces may one day give India the ability to do this in a, in a war uh, or in a, in a scenario where, let's say, the Pakistani nuclear force falls under extremist hands or something like that. But, but, I, but the problem is also that because, India's, India, because of India's BMD capability, Pakistan is also engaging in, in sort of measures to counter them. For Cruise Merving. missiles, they'll MIRV. Uh, and, you know, I think South Asia, a lot of the focus in the U.S. and I think worldwide has been on North Korea for the last year, uh, two years or so. Uh, but I think under the radar, Pakistan has been off to the races. It has been for 20 years now. Uh, and India is quietly putting a lot of these pieces in place uh, where it can think about damage limitation. And it's not irrational for India to do this. I actually, I'm very sympathetic to the Indian strategic dilemma, which is how much terrorism allegedly or actually sponsored by Pakistan can you take before you say enough is enough and we need to reopen the conventional space again. But you know that if you you know, open up a real conventional front that is punitive enough to deter Pakistan, it means an assault across the international border. And you don't know where Pakistan red lines are then. And then Pakistan threatens to use tactical nuclear weapons. So then what do you do? This issue about if Pakistan uses, ta you know, battlefield nuclear, I don't like the term tactical nuclear weapons, Battle battlefield. battlefield nuclear weapons on Pakistani soil, but on Indian forces, Indian's doctrine, the holy doctrine says, India, India will retaliate massively. But nobody really thinks that's credible, right? Is India really going to destroy... Uh, well, in, in the sense that it was mass, massive retaliation, it's countervalue retaliation. Is India going to de destroy seven to ten Pakistani cities in retaliation for tactical or battlefield nuclear use on its own soil? Probably not. Yeah. And Pakistan had seized on this dilemma and said, there's no way you're going to retaliate with countervalue strikes if we do this. So the game over. And so there was this aborted attempt with cold start. You know, and no one could really figure out the fundamental problem and paradox of Cold Start, which is you could launch quick offenses, but where do you stop? And how can you really calibrate conventional operations below some unspecified Pakistani red line? You it's just don't know. Surgical strike, the answer. I mean, I personally believe that surgical strike led to more violence in Jammu and Kashmir and attacks against India, but is, is surgical strike probably the answer I mean, answer the, problem, the problem with surgical strikes is that the, it, it doesn't do enough damage to really deter Pakistan from supporting these kinds of attacks. In it order to reputational purposes. It, it's, it's, it's to satisfy domestic public opinion, largely. I mean, this is, in, in, in the U.S., this is also the same dilemma. Uh, and to really do damage to the Pakistan army would involve conventional military operations. And Cold Start was a way to start those operations quicker, but it didn't change the concept, which was you were going to have to attrit big portions of the Pakistan army. 
And that risks Pakistan's crossing Pakistan's nuclear red line. Well, there's the other issue, which is um, it, the, the surgical strikes were carried out across the line of control. And, and not the international do, border. And not the international right. border. So if you, if you carry out things across the line of control, it may not necessarily meet with that kind of reaction. Absolutely correct. And I think this has always been the unstated rule of India-Pakistan tit-for-tat relations, which is uh, operations across the line of the, a line of control are not held with the same kind of significance and fear mm -hmm. by Pakistan as operations across the international border. There's this real question at some point, you know, India debates, okay, how much restraint can we, can we, uh, you know, have in light of attacks on the homeland and metropolitan India? And we can have the view that Indian restraint has actually been the best mm -hmm. strategic answer to all of this, right? Because at the end of the day, a war is going to be much more costly right. than accepting periodic attacks. But at some point, you know, there could be an attack that is, you know, so outrageous and of such a scale that India has no choice. And then you're, the, the, the dilemma is what happens if Pakistan uses a tactical nuclear weapon? And, you know, the idea that there would be counter value strikes wasn't believed to be credible. And so it wasn't irrational to say, you know, the U.S. has long had a counterforce strategy, always because it's consistent with the laws of war, you can't intentionally target civilians, right? So counter value strikes means mm -hmm. you're threatening innocent civilians in retaliation. And one of the big reasons why the U.S. has always had this impulse and temptation or compulsion to counter force is because uh, it's consistent with the laws of war. It also is very attractive from a U.S. military and strategic perspective, which is if you can <coughs> limit damage once, you know, a nuclear war, which is always going to be devastating anyway, uh, then you're better off than if you expose yourself to strategic nuclear retaliation, right? Because you run through the scenario where if India retaliates with counter value strikes against Pakistan, Pakistan still retains 30 to 40 to 50 strategic nuclear weapons and you're going to be retaliated against yourself. And then you lose an Indian city. So the temptation is to say, look, it's a small enough force. We have accuracy. We have surveillance. The idea that we can limit damage by getting 20 to 30 up to, you know, uh, the full complement of Pakistani strategic nuclear forces and then use missile defenses to pick up any residuals is not, it's not irrational. It's in a scenario where you're trying to limit damage already once Pakistan has used uh, tactical nuclear weapons. And it's not war fighting. It's trying to limit damage once Pakistan has made the grievous error of using battlefield nuclear weapon against Indian forces. And you have to have a credible answer. Well, what do you think uh, the Indian forces have that kind of uh, accuracy and um, um, that Maybe not today. I don't think surveillance? I don't, and I think in the long run, Pakistan can do a lot more to complicate this than India can do to sustain you know, uh, an advantage over... But, the, but, but I think the argument we were making is that therefore the Indian investment in the BMD program is in the right direction. The Pakistani fear is that missile defenses are, are designed to support damage limitation or counterforce. The reality is, though, India is not going to do this in a bolt out of the blue. It would only be yeah. in the yeah. event of a reaction or, I mean, the, the, the concern, though, is if Pakistan is afraid of this kind of attack, then it won't just limit its first use to the battlefield. And so the India needs to have this option to go preemptively in the event that it detects imminent use of Pakistani nuclear weapons. And it's long been the strand since the draft nuclear doctrine. The draft nuclear doctrine in 1999 used the phrase, India will not be the first to initiate a nuclear strike and not to use nuclear weapons. And there's always been this tension with India's no first use declaration about what would constitute first use. Is it the initiate, detection of initiation of use or an actual detonation? Mm -hmm. And people, I think, forget the Prime Minister Vajpayee himself in 2000 said, you know, if you, if you think that we're going to sit back while you drop a bomb on us, you're, you're gravely mistaken. And there's long been, I think, this kind of tension about, well, if, if, it, if it's clear that Pakistan's about to initiate nuclear use, then all restrictions about Indian, you know, no first use at that point are off. We've been, let me bring you back to the um, global strategic stability sure, yeah. question that uh, we were discussing. In, in January this year, the Economist magazine wrote that disruptive new technologies, worsening relations between Russia and America, and a less cautious Russian leadership 
um, uh, than in the Cold War have raised fears that a new era of strategic instability may be approaching and add uh, Trump's madness into this. Um, so do you think there is there is a serious worry about strategic instability at the at the great power level uh, and this and this withdrawal of the Americans from the INF treaties that an indication of a desire to take this to the um, uh, battlefield? I think we're in a, a new I do think 2017 marked a new uh, open arms race, I think, between the U.S., Russia, and quietly China. Mm -hmm. China's been modernizing its force and now has uh, allegedly five SSBNs. Uh, it is working on hypersonic glide vehicles also. Russia's been working on measures to defeat missile defenses. But I think the, the big break in U.S.-Russia relations has been the issue of theater nuclear forces. And the U.S. national defense strategy, the nuclear posture review, were all driven. China was kind of was mentioned, uh, but almost as an afterthought. And the real concern was that you know Russia was going to try to finish the job with Ukraine, basically. And there was this incident with the Ukrainians in December, um, and that in the event of Russia conventionally seizing, either with ir irregular or regular forces, a Baltic state or an ally of the United States, and the U.S. and NATO had to respond conventionally, and Russia started losing the war, it would use a battlefield nuclear weapon. So it's very similar to the India-Pakistan scenario. And then what do you do, right? And so the U.S. response was, you know, Russia had this theory that they could, like Pakistan, use a battlefield nuclear weapon and it'd be war terminating. And the U.S. was seized with a very similar strategic dilemma. So you can't counterforce the Russian force, too big. Although there are those who would say you might have a sporting shot. I think that's <laughs> strategic suicide. So the U.S. started pushing on, uh, you know, what about other low-yield capabilities? And I think the race between the U.S. and Russia now is at the battlefield level, right? So the U.S. proposed and has, is will deploy a low-yield SLBM, uh, so a 5 to 7 kilotons, you know, submarine-launched ballistic missile to hold Russian territory at risk with a low-yield capability. Uh, and that has real implications for strategic stability because Russian early warning sees an SLBM, which could carry up to 3.6 megatons worth of yield before if it was fully merved, uh, or can now carry a single five kiloton warhead. Is it going to wait to see what hits before reacting? You know, that's a bet that I wouldn't be willing to take, but the authors of the U.S. Nuclear Posture Review seem to be willing to, to, to take that bet. Uh, and then the INF Treaty, right? So. Russia's been in violation of the INF Treaty for many years now with the 9M729 missile. It's been tested out to ranges short of the INF, uh, but there's no question, I think, within the U.S. intelligence community and others that you know, it's a violation of the INF Treaty. So the U.S. said, okay, well, we're going to threaten to withdraw from the INF Treaty, uh, and hasn't actually yet, but we're starting the clock on notification withdrawal. The hope being that the threat to withdraw and an unending INF arms race between the U.S. and Russia would be enough to comply, to get Russia to get back into compliance with the INF Treaty. I suspect Russia won't come back into compliance with the threat to withdraw, and so the U.S. has painted itself kind of in a corner where it basically has to withdraw now, and Bolton has ordered the Defense Department to start looking at ground-based systems that would be in the INF range to deploy in Europe and then also in East Asia. Uh, and so, you know, the question is where, where would you base them? Because you have to host nuclear systems essentially in allied states, and there's you know, allergies in both East Asia and Europe to doing so. But if we manage to find partners to do that, then, you know, U.S. and Russia are modernizing at the high level, the strategic nuclear level. Russia has a new ICBM. The U.S. is modernizing its entire strategic nuclear force. And then you might have an open, uh, an unending arms race at the theater nuclear force. But, but, but Sorry, um, um, but again, sort of going back to the uh, emerging uh, strategic technologies, some people make the argument that it is China that is probably leading the race in, in some of these new technologies, for instance, uh, um, um, uh, th hypersonic, 3D printing, um, quantum computing, 5G, wireless connectivity, artificial intelligence, etc. If China is one of the leading countries in all of this, um, I'm, I'm, I'm more concerned about the Asian strategic stability. Right. How, what, what does that mean for India? Well, you know, for a lot of um, these, you know, China... Uh, a, a, a lot of these technologies are dual use, obviously, right? 3D printing has a lot of commercial applications. Right, right, right. 5G has a lot of commercial applications. Hypersonics don't. So hypersonics are driven almost entirely by the fear of missile defenses. India doesn't have missile defenses that could really, you know, 
do a lot to intercept Chinese forces anyway in the event. I don't see a scenario where China and India ever get into a nuclear conflict uh, or even a real shooting war anyway. Even you can have, you know, a dozen doklums and none of them get into a shooting war. India has a very strong deterrent in the East and is augmenting that deterrent. Uh, and so, you know, the, the terrain and the stakes make it very unlikely. It, doklums need to be managed, there's no question. Uh, and China's appetite for peeling off allies in India's otherwise, you know, historical uh, alliance system in the in the Northeast, for example, with Bhutan, uh, Nepal, Sri Lanka, you know, the, these are these are political uh, challenges for India. It's, it's not really a military challenge because it can't really escalate to a point where either side is existentially threatened. But that's different for the U.S., China, and the naval balance in in the Pacific, I think, and so. You know, a lot of these modernization efforts for China are directed at the United States. And, you know, if U.S. missile defenses, you know, there's one view that U.S. missile defenses don't work now, so Chinese RVs can already penetrate. Uh, but in a world in which U.S. missile defenses could work, then the hypersonics really pose a problem. And so this is China's effort, I think, to maintain strategic stability. Mm -hmm. And to get the U.S., I think, in particular, and I've always been of the view that, you know, it would be very difficult, I think, to uh, completely eliminate China's strategic nuclear force. And so saying that we have mutually assured vulnerability and destruction with China and Russia is a statement of basic fact at the moment. Uh, even though Washington doesn't want to admit that, I think that's kind of the state of affairs now. And you know, the, a lot of these developments now are being driven by Chinese and Russian fears that the US refuses to admit it and will persistently try to threaten it down the road. Uh, and so a lot of these technologies are designed to stay ahead of their fear that the U.S. will one day be able to neutralize their strategic nuclear force. But Bipin, I mean, um, much of this is really in the conventional military realm. India's preparations, for example, take the deterrent patrol of Arihant. Um, so the, the, the talk in the community, the preparations that we can see um, from, the, from, from outside the government, all of it seems to cater to an eventuality where there is a conventional military threat by Pakistan or China, and India seems to be prepared for that. What about um, some of these some of these um, uh, strides that China is making in the new technologies? How well prepared or how ill prepared, in, in your opinion, is India to cater to some of these threats or challenges? So, in the event that India were to deploy, let's say, S four hundred into the Northeast, a lot of these technologies. I mean, it's true that China's, uh, you know. China's uh, hypersonics and uh, its advances in 3D printing and AI give it conventional advantages that in the long run may pose problems for India. The other big problem though is, you know, India's move to sea was designed to be, and the Ari Hunt in particular, although I'd be, you know, it's been referred to as a deterrent patrol, but I'd be very surprised if there were nuclear weapons aboard. And if there weren't nuclear weapons aboard, it's, it's an operational patrol. It's not a deterrent. Optics. Oh, yeah, and you know, you have to test the communications. It's just, you know, to call it a deterrent patrol implies there are nuclear weapons on board the submarine. I'd be very surprised if that, that was the case. And with what range? And, yeah, I mean, they would have been K-15, so 750 kilometers, which are not really useful for China anyway. Uh, and so the, the, this assumption, though, that the Arihant, uh, Arihant leaving aside, but even S-2 and the future SSBNs will be survivable as China develops these networks, maritime sensors also, is something that India, I think, and Pakistan, the move to sea doesn't necessarily solve all of the survivability concerns uh, that uh, may have driven those programs in the first place. The land-based nuclear and missile force is easier to manage. <clears throat> it is much more survivable than I think it gets credit for because you're not facing states that are trying to threaten the survivability of, land of India's land-based force. And the management challenges and the survivability challenges of an SSBN force in the future, I think, should you know generate a real debate as to whether it's worth the investment of how many billions of dollars in trying to uh, develop a full complement of SSBNs that are survivable, that are reliable, that don't have the risk of accidents. You know, if India has a bastion strategy, they're very vulnerable as they go out into the ocean. And you've had you've had a conversation about this before uh, on this program. Uh, and, you know, at some point you have to, it's worth asking strategically whether the juice is worth the squeeze because it's a very expensive program. It's much more difficult to manage. Uh, the missiles will be fully mated when they go out to sea. Uh, and the, there are a limited number of communication stations. Those will be the first things that are hit in a conventional conflict. So then you may lose communication with the SSBNs. And then what, right? And so 
the to me it seems like the a more rational and easier to manage strategy for India, given that its land-based force is very survivable, uh, is to focus on augmenting the survivability and the complement of land-based forces, uh, because the investment in the sea-based force is, you know, it's difficult. We forget that the the UK and the French had SSBNs that had a, that hit each other, right. just only a decade ago, and so accidents at sea with SSBNs are, you know, are, are and we don't have any possible for everybody, place. right? Yeah. Incidents at sea treaties yeah. and. Uh, but but you'd also say that India should invest in some of these new technologies, at least sort of uh, oh, be absolutely. aware of uh, yeah. I mean, what it, what it, what and it so, be. you know, and if, if there's one thing I think India has been very good at is uh, it may lag behind China and the U.S., but eventually, you know, I don't think India's forces get enough credit. The Brahmos is a hell of a missile. Absolutely. It is a hell of a one missile. One of the best in that class. Absolutely. And, you know, the S-400 is very capable, and a lot of these are imported and with joint development with the Russians, but that's fine. The Agnes are wholly homegrown, and you know, no, very few states can say that. And I don't think India gets enough credit, you know. And it may lag behind, and sometimes you know, the tests fail. But the only test that fails is one you don't learn from. And if there's one thing that ISRO and DRDO have been very good at, is learning. I think from their, you know, even failed tests, and eventually the Agni Five is going to be inducted very soon. Uh, I have no doubt that India will work on and deploy MIRVs. Uh, or maneuverable reentry vehicles, and all of these technologies will eventually be incorporated. And uh, you know, India gets a bad rap. I think the program gets a bad rap for being slow, but eventually it gets there. And uh, I have no doubt that they will be investing in these capabilities. Uh, but they don't need to necessarily be driven by China because I don't think China's investment in these capabilities necessarily threatens India right now, since they're mostly driven by the U.S. And so, like everything else within India, eventually gets there. They do guard it, and, you know, it's slow. Uh, but, you know, it's an impressive program. And, uh, you know, there's, I have no doubt that they'll eventually get there anyway. They've been wonderful talking to you. Very great to talk to you. Thanks, Thank Matthew. you. Bye. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. To receive instant updates on all videos from The Wire, click the subscribe button and hit the bell icon. Pay to support independent journalism. Click the link in the description and choose the amount you want to pay.